Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out to the session. Appreciate it. So today, I'm just going to be talking about how to apply offensive techniques to various cloud infrastructures, um, like AWS, Azure, GCP, things like that. So um, yeah, yeah, good times. So uh, here's kind of a brief agenda of what's going to be going on in the talk. So I'll talk briefly about who I am. I'll talk kind of like high level, how you go from nothing to you know, the admin over a cloud environment. And I'll talk just a little bit about um, you know, SSO to token stealing or browser cookie stealing, which I've seen some of the other talks at. Um, St. Con have been talking about that a bunch, so that's great to hear. That's getting out there. And then we'll kind of dive into some different graph database technologies to help you map out attack vectors inside of your AWS, Azure, GCP environments. And then we'll talk, if we got time, about just some, uh, you know, some use cases on how cloud infrastructure gets bridged with on-prem and where the weak points are there. And then, you know, stay tuned to the last. Uh, I got just one thing at the end that should be pretty cool. So, all right. So I'm Bryce. I used to work at Homeland. I was over incident response and hunt for their unclassified network. So that was over half a million endpoints worldwide, where we're really trying to track down nation states and strategically remove them from that network. Subsequently, uh, my real passion is the offensive side of the house. So I ended up working at the NSA and built an offensive unit there for them. And uh, relocated to Utah uh, for, to be closer to family and started working at Adobe, built out a red team for Adobe's digital experience business unit, which highly leverages cloud infrastructure. You know, they have a huge presence in AWS, Azure, GCP. So really started to take kind of those like offensive nation state type techniques and apply them to the cloud and more tech and DevOps type culture. And how can we get into cloud environments? How can we expand access? Founded stage two security. And uh, you know, I lead the offensive portion of that company today. Uh, so we're at about 60 employees today. So, um, and then I also uh, run the charity that runs the local B-Side Salt Lake City event. Uh, so just a quick plug for B-Sides. It's going to happen in December. It's one day, Friday, and it's in Sandy. So I hope, hope you guys can come out. There's a hardware badge that Wayland's been working on. That should be pretty cool. OK, just kind of diving into the talk. All right, so high level, how do, how do you go from nothing to cloud admin, right? So one way is you can look at the services and applications that are exposed on the internet. So in the classic scenario that you saw kind of in the Capital One breach and a lot of other breaches and bug bounty reports, uh, if you can find a bug in an application that's hosted in a cloud environment, and then you can you know, convince that to go to the metadata service, uh, you'll be able to pull back the temporary credentials, and then you know, whatever access that server has inside of the target's AWS account, you're, the attacker is going to be able to reuse those temporary credentials and have that same access. So, so a lot of times, you know, you'll see attackers find vulnerabilities in applications, like an SSRF vulnerability, that enables them to grab these temporary credentials, which then enables them to pull back data that's like private inside of like storage accounts like S3. So that's that's one common scenario. You know, another scenario, which I don't think there's as much research in this space, um, but I, I talked a little bit about it last year at SanCon, is um, really the globally shared resources. So, and there's basically two angles here. If you have an admin in an AWS, Azure, GCP environment, some of those services are going to enable them to share those resources globally across all AWS accounts. Um, so for example, let's say you create an instance or a VM in AWS. And then you create, that has a volume attached to it, like an EBS volume. That's kind of like the hard disk, right? Like the, you know, the VHD equivalent in the cloud. And then you can create a snapshot of that. And then you can actually share those snapshots publicly. So, um, and then you know, an attacker could go through all those publicly accessible snapshots and try to mine them for secrets. So some researchers did this at a university previously, and they, they were able to find some pretty, um, pretty bad practices, like people sharing snapshots quickly and then unsharing them. They were able to get in between those windows and grab a copy and get secrets for the organization. An another angle here is really that whole supply chain angle, where you know, if you're relying on public resources to deploy your instances, like 
Let's say you're like, hey, I want a, you know, a Kali VM in AWS, but I wanted to have this like specific setup, and somebody else has already done that, so you can import their AMI or their image or for their instance. How do you know that that's in a good state? How do you know that someone hasn't tampered with that? Um, yeah, so there's like those kind of supply chain attacks as well. Okay, and then lastly, uh, you know, the third way is really that client side. You're going after the engineers that are writing the code. You're going after the SREs or admins of the AWS environment. You're trying to get on their laptops or steal their sessions to the cloud providers and then reuse those sessions. Um, so a lot of different attack paths here to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about what's been successful for us on the team as we move through this talk. OK, so SSO tokens and browser cookies, we'll just talk about kind of, um, you know, there's a number of ways that you could get on an endpoint or a laptop. You know, the classic ones kind of being like macros or office document attacks. Um, but, you know, those are kind of been covered elsewhere, so I'm not talking about those. I just wanted to talk about two things that are, are more cutting edge, in my opinion, and where I see kind of the future going. So. So the first one, which I don't really see many people talking about, is malicious browser extensions, right? If you can get in the browser and you get code executing there, um, you know, a lot of times for these SaaS platforms or these cloud providers, that's, that's going to be game over. Uh, so shout out to Kevin Lustig. Uh, he kind of turned me on to this tool and technique. But uh, basically, if we can get code running in the browser uh, and they have an, a session to the AWS or another SaaS app, we can kind of write across that session. So, and a lot of times that comes in the form of installing a malicious browser plugin in the end user's browser. So um, there is a toolkit out there that's public called Curse Chrome, which does an excellent job of demonstrating this and would be a good launching off point if you wanted to recreate these attacks um, in your red teaming or pen testing engagements. Um, so basically, this is a malicious plugin that can get installed inside Chrome browsers and will allow the attacker to proxy their traffic through the user's browser and access whatever the user is currently authenticated to. Um, you know, a defense against this, if you're more on the defensive side, is really to look into enterprise policies that can be applied for your browser like Chrome. You know, you could apply an enterprise policy that would prevent just random, you know, uh, extensions from being loaded in the browser, and uh, you know would kind of help prevent some of these attacks, right? And there's a, a reference to a project at the bottom of this slide too that would help you there with that. So I've started to hear more and more breaches occurring where someone will get code execution to a laptop or an endpoint, and then they'll load up malicious um, extensions. And uh, you know with the advanced features in Chrome where they're sharing profiles against multiple laptops. Imagine you compromise someone's desktop, but then they're sharing that profile with another endpoint. You could potentially get a lateral movement technique just from sharing a malicious extension across a user's profile, right? Like Chrome profile, Google profile. So I, I think this will probably ramp up more in the next year or two as well. OK, so we've heard a lot about adversary mail and tax throughout SaintCon. And this is kind of our, our go-to right now as, as a like pen testing red teaming organization. So uh, shout outs to Brad. He, he wrote some awesome code here that helped us uh, you know, kind of go undetected um, and kind of set up our infrastructure on this. So, um, but basically, you know, if a user, if we can, if they're browsing and going through our evil proxy server, we can um, you know, ride their session to whatever they're authenticating to, right? Whether that's like an SSO solution, like Okta, or that's directly to like an AWS account, something like that. Um, so how do we get the user to do that? You know, typically you would use a phishing or social engineering type attack, um, get the user to click on a link, then that would induce the user to log into their SSO system, and then you would kind of write, write along that session. So once you do that, the attacker can pick up the same credentials that are inside that browser session, replay them, and get access to the apps. You know, including like potentially like SaaS platforms if you have like Okta tied in with AWS access and things like that. So for the most part, if you're just staying in the browser and you're stealing the browser's cookies, right, 
the EDRs are, are mostly blind to that at this point, right? So they're not, they're mostly looking for kind of those classic MITRE attack techniques, which are a lot of like host-based techniques. Um, so you can almost like bypass a lot of really stringent organizations, security controls on the endpoint. And the toolkit that's really popular for this, some of them I listed on this slide, but Evil Jinx is one of the most popular, and GoFish is one of the most popular for sending the phishing email. So Evil Jinx is kind of like that proxy server. GoFish is how you're sending the emails, which would have a link that would kind of go through your proxy server. And then, you know, recently there's been a project to kind of combine these two projects into one. So that's called Evil Go Fish, um, which is something that I want to dig into more, but uh, looks pretty promising. All right, so what, how do you really get busted in this scenario? Like, let's say you email a user a link, right? And you're trying to get them to log into their Okta, right? So um, their SSO system. So um, the link is not going to go to the, a real domain name. It's going to go to like an attacker-owned domain name, right? So um, now the attacker is probably going to have valid certs associated with that domain name and maybe hosted on a trusted provider. So it may be kind of hard for you to know, but you know, you could use those classic techniques of domain name reputation or things like that to try to stop this. But more effectively is really the FIDO2 plus WebAuthn standards, right? So the FIDO2 plus WebAuthn, if you're using those technologies combined, especially with like a hardware device like YubiKey, they're going to automatically verify the domain name as part of that authentication process, and they're going to prevent you from going through these evil proxy servers. So. So this is a scenario we've, we've run into in a few organizations that are really security forward. Um, and so uh, we came up uh, with something a little innovative that I'll show at the end of this that would help get past this. But, um, but you know, this, you know, for 99% of orgs right now, they're, they're not doing FIDO2 plus WebAuthn for everything. So it, it's you know, still really popular and growing in popularity among criminal groups. Okay, great. Okay, so that's kind of like the client-side attack. We'll loop back around to um, a, a cool technique at the end, but uh, I want to take a minute and just talk about graph database technologies, because I feel like, especially from the defender's point of view, these things would be immensely helpful if um, you know, security engineers started leveraging them more. So uh, we, when we go in and we do an audit or a pen test of a cloud environment, we highly leverage these type of tools to find misconfigurations um, and then, you know, write those up in the report. So, so let's, let's kind of dive into it more. But first, just shout out to Paul and Michael. Um, they, a lot of the research here is because of work that they, they did over the years. So, Okay, so why use a graph database? And may, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about, but graph database are kind of like the bloodhound equivalents, right? They're going to generate these, these charts, right? And basically, we'll walk through this a bit more, but you're basically going to be able to chain together resources or policies or roles and how you could effectively use those to escalate from one user level access to a, a privileged admin ac level access. Um, and some of the tools that do this are kind of listed in the corner here on the left, um, some of the ones that I've used in the past on engagements. Uh, so, but let's just kind of walk through it. So first, um, they generally have like a collection mechanism, so they'll get read-only access to your AWS, Azure, or GCP environment, and they'll just collect a bunch of data. And then once they collect the data, they'll analyze it, and then they'll kind of graph it, and then they'll make this stuff available for you to be able to query um, using a GraphDB technology. And, uh, it, but once you get all that data in the environment like this, you kind of set what you want your goal to be. Like a common goal is, hey, I want to get admin access inside this AWS account. So you would just load up the goal inside of the GraphDB tool. This, the tool I'm showing you right now is this open source AWS PX tool. Um, so you guys can download and use that. It's really easy to use. Uh, Storm Swatter, Spotter works very similarly. And Road Tools is um, the same, but doesn't have as much of a graph uh, interface. So um, Cloud Suite is kind of like a combination of Storm Spotter and AWS PX. So. OK, so you set the goal, I want to get admin on this AWS account, right? And let's assume this is an AWS account where everyone's not already admin. Let's assume there's tiers, like there's an engineering role inside of it, and an engineering group inside of it, and there's a, you know, an admin group inside of it. And you know, maybe you can get on an engineer's laptop and still their session, but 
you want to get access to everything in the AWS account. So we set the goal, and then we just kind of right click on it, and we select, hey, I want to see all the inbound routes. Just like, show me all the ways you could possibly get to effective admin inside of this AWS environment. And it, the tool will kind of give you a little detail in the corner about what you're doing, so that's usually useful to check out. And then, then it will generate the graph, right? So it says, okay, here's all the routes on how you would get inbound to effective admin in this AWS environment. And this is, you know, like a lab environment that I'm showing you here now. So this is not even like a production environment. In a real production environment, these graphs could be a lot more complex, right? So, um, but, uh, you know, this is kind of a good demonstration of what you would see in real life. So, um, so then you would kind of get all these routes, and then you would just kind of dig through it. Like, you would say, all right, which ones connect directly to effective admin, and then what connects to that? And I'll walk you through this scenario so it kind of hopefully resonates a bit more through the Prezo. But, but uh, yeah, you know, how are those lines useful? Let's, let's kind of walk through that. So you're using AWS PX. You gave read-only rights into your AWS environment. There's some resources there, and now you're trying to make sense of the, of the graph it's generated. All right, so we got to go back to the basics to really understand the power of this, this map. And you know, if you know AWS well, um, this will just be kind of a quick refresher. But if you don't know AWS, um, you know, this will be critical to kind of understanding what those nodes mean on the graph. So, so let's go back and do just a quick refresher on IAM roles, because I feel like that's an area that a lot of people um, you know, have some knowledge of, but maybe don't have all the pieces, right? So let's say you're in AWS. You have an AWS account, right? And you want to add, you want your friend to be able to use your AWS account. You would go to the identity and access um, service, IAM service, inside of AWS, and you would add your friend. So my friend's name in this scenario is Joel, Joe, right? And you have a couple options. Like, AWS is very flexible on how you configure it. Um, but you want, Joe needs to be able to get to a database. Like, let's say you have a database in there, and you're doing some admin activity, and you're like, man, I just want to push this off so Joe will handle it. Um, but the only permissions that Joe has right now is the ability to assume into, like, kind of a role, right? Which, are, which a role is kind of like a service account, right, in AWS. So, so if Joe goes and he tries to access the database right now, he's going to get blocked, right? You would need to add this R some level of RDS permissions to that policy attached to the user uh, in order to enable him to get to the database. So, so basically, you'd have an identity like Joe. You would attach a policy. You would define in the policy what you want Joe to be able to do. And um, you know, if you don't enable any RDS actions, he's not going to be able to directly get to the database, right? So one thing you could do is just add the RDS permissions to that policy. That'd be easy, and then you could get to the database. But you'd probably want to tightly couple that, like scope it, so he can't get to all databases. You could just get to the database that he's supposed to admin. Um, you know, another option is you could create this IAM service role, right? Or this IAM role, right? And it could be kind of like a, a service account. So, and you could name the role RDS read only. And it's going to have two, pol when you create a role, you're going to have two policies attached to it. You're going to have a permissions policy. And this is going to be pretty similar to the policy we just talked about that was attached to the user. It's going to say what, what the role can do, right? So here we're going to say this RDS read only role can. Uh, you know, describe RDS databases. So there, that role can go down and look at the database and get to the data that's in there. But another thing that the role is going to have that's a little bit unique is it's going to have a trust policy attached to it. And that trust policy is going to say who can use the role. Um, so in this scenario, we're going to say Joe can use the role. So Joe can use the role. The role has permissions to use, talk to the database. And so therefore, you know, Joe could assume into the role and then access the database and do his admin activities. So, so you know, this might be overly complex for this slight scenario, um, but uh, um, as you, you'll kind of see as the slides go, you know, roles are kind of a staple inside AWS um, to enable resources inside of it to access other resources in the same account or cross account. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit for a minute about a special um, permission called IEM pass role. So, so when you 
are an admin in AWS, and you go to create a new VM or a new instance, and then you want that instance or the application on the instance to be able to access other AWS services, you're going to have to give that resource some level of permission. And it's really this IEM pass role that's going to enable permission that's going to enable you to do that. So let's say you have another user in your account called Rida. And she has the ability, she's an EC2 admin. So she can create new VMs all day long. So she creates a VM. She installs the application on it, or an instance. Um, and she installs the application on it. And the application wants to access data that's in an S3 bucket, right? Well, the application, it's going to get blocked, right? Because it doesn't have any way to authenticate to the S3 service to get the files that are there. So what we can do, though, is we can create what's called an instance profile. And we can attach that to the EC2 instance. So here we're creating the EC2 S3 read-only instance profile. And that, it's going to link together the instance with a role. So then we're going to build a role, and that role is going to have two policies. So one policy is going to say who can use it. So in this example, an EC2 server can use the role. And what can it do? It can read files from an S3 bucket. So in this fashion, you can create servers and then enable the applications on those servers to access other resources inside of AWS. Um, but you, know, you can't really attach a role or an instance profile to an application without this IEM pass role permission. Otherwise, it's going to get blocked because you wouldn't want a user to be able to just attach a higher level role arbitrarily to an instance and kind of escalate their privileges um, that way. So, so they make you actually call out in the permissions associated with the right a user that the user has the rights to pass roles. And then you can specify a, like a list of roles that they have the rights to pass to the resources they're creating. OK, what does the policies kind of look like? Um, this is kind of an example. So whenever you see these kind of JSON type policies, in AWS, um, these are what you, know, you would create to enable um, the attachment, uh, the pass role permissions associated with the user. OK, so we go in, we create the policy, we add the policy so the user writer can use that. Now the user writer has the pass role permission so they can attach profiles and roles to instances. So then now they can create an instance, install the application, attach the profile and the role, and then get the, the rights to access the S3 service. OK, so then the only thing that might snag you up at this point is services inside of S in AWS can also have additional like access control type features. So, so S3 is one of those. Um, so when you create a bucket, that you would put objects or files inside of in, in AWS, you, are, you can set a bucket policy. So that'd be another JSON policy that could restrict who can access um, objects in there. So you, you know, that might be another point where you, know, you get blocked um, from accessing it. And then there's another feature in S3 that's kind of more a legacy one that uses more XML formatted documents that's called S3 ACLs. And those could be attached to the bucket optionally that could prevent access to objects. So, so there's kind of all these multiple layers. And it's really up to you, the person architecting the security solution for your AWS environment, to say, where do you want to focus and restrict the access? Right? Do you want to restrict the access on the pol permissions policies that are attached to the identities? Uh, do you want to restrict the the permissions based on where, the, where your data is, like more closer to the services that exist in S3? Um, and, or do you want to use some combination of that? And really, um, you know, if one policy says you can access it, but the other policy says, no, you cannot, it, AWS is going to use the one that's most, it's going to use the combination that's most restrictive. So you could be using a combination of those as well. Um, but obviously, like the more complex you make it, the harder it is to audit it and figure out what the actual permissions of your environment are. OK, so, uh, we so once it's all done, role gets attached to the EC2 instance. The EC2 instance right here 
It, this is like kind of the who am I of AWS. So if you do AWS, STS, get caller identity, you can see like, okay, the, I'm now authenticated as the role called EC2-S3-read-only, and uh, that's on this instance. And then from there, you know, that has access to access the S3 bucket, so I can list the buckets, I can look at the objects inside the buckets, and I can, cat out those, I can copy those back to local and cat them out to get this sweet elephant ASCII art. Um, all right, so that was a lot of just kind of uh, background. Thanks to Scott. Um, he just kind of reviewed this, those slides to make sure I wasn't leading you totally astray. Um, so, uh, so now that we kind of have a better understanding of IEM roles and pass role, let's talk about the GraphDB and how, how that relates to it in a pretty basic example. So, so okay, we're in AWS PX. We set the goal of getting an effective admin. We identify, want to identify all the inbound paths to become an effective admin that generates this big chart. Right? So let's just start to dive into the chart. So what is an effective admin? It's basically someone who has a policy attached, and that policy says, I can do any action on any resource inside of this AWS account. Right? So if we can get to that level of permissions, that's basically game all over. Um, and we find that there is one IEM policy that has those permissions. So that's this first little arrow that says it's attached. And that little icon of the checklist is, is an IEM policy. Okay, and so then you look at what has access to the IEM policy. So then you see, oh, there's a role that exists in IEM which has that policy attached. And it, in turn, uh, has a trust policy which would allow EC2 instances to leverage it or use it. Um, you can see there in the trust policy on the left, it has EC2 listed as one of the services that could attach to this role. This role could be attached to. Okay, so then you're like, all right, that's, that's cool, that's cool, but I still need an instance profile. So then you back up the graph even more, and you say like, oh, there's already an instance profile inside the environment that is using that, that points to that role, which points to that policy, which gives us effective admin. So really, if I'm an attacker, and I get access to an account, and that account can do pass role and run the instance, I could attach that pre-existing profile, which would give me access to that role, which would give me effective admin in the environment. And then we can identify all the users that have that policy attached. So here you can see there's this privs3 user that has that policy. So if we compromise privs3's laptop or get access to his AWS session, we can use that escalation path to get to admin. And this, this is just kind of a simple example, right? So, but you start at the top, and then you just kind of work your way down, and you can figure out you know, where you want to go. I mean, obviously, you can work it other ways. Like, if you have access to a user, you could work it the opposite direction, too, right? OK, so, so we compromise the privs3 user, right? And we get, his, we get his credentials. Right here, we're doing that AWS who am I command to get his credentials. Um, and then using his credentials, we try to get to the data in S3, right? We're like, all right, we got some creds, let's try. We get all access to NIS. We cannot get to the data in S3. So then we start up a Netcat listener on the attacker side. And, you know, we find our current IP address, which is this 143 address. And then we create, like, just a little mini script. And that script will do a connect back on a Debian slash Ubuntu-based box to our Netcat listener. But the one thing we know we can do is we can create an instance, right? So we're going to leverage those credentials to create an EC2 instance. We're going to attach the already existing instance profile that has the role, which has the policy that we want. That's going to assign, create some temporary credentials um, that the user is going to enable us to do. So here we go. Um, we launch a new EC2 instance in this command. And we use that little script we built that does the connect back to us as the boot script for that. So when the EC2 starts up, it will run our connect back shell and give us kind of an interactive session with it. So there we go. We created an instance. We had that user data script and that connect back to our netcat listener. Now we kind of get the interactive C2 comms over netcat going with the instance. <laughs> 
we see here on our netcat, we'll get like a connection was received, and now we can run commands, and those commands are running with the context of that EC2 instance we just created. Okay, once we do that, we can just curl the metadata service, which is located at this IP address 169.254.169.254. That's in an RFC spec, and on most cloud providers, it's going to be located at that IP address. There are some exceptions to that on other cloud providers, but um, you can look at their documentation to find their cloud service provider specific implementation of the metadata service. And once we do that, we're going to be able to get those temporary credentials, which are going to have those kind of effective admin um, permissions uh, over our netcat listener. Then we'll load up those temporary credentials on our attacker box. So right here, we see the netcat. And inside the netcat, I execute the curl statement. And inside the curl's response, I'll see back this, AK, or this ASIA access key, secret key, and token. And then I can use those three values to kind of impersonate the permissions that an EC2 instance has right now. So I get those temporary credentials as an attacker. And then I populate my AWS CLI configuration file, which is that's that top file right there. And once I do that, and once I do the who am I command, I now have access to that role that was attached to that EC2 instance. So from there, I should be able to access the data in the S3 bucket, because I now have effective admin inside that AWS account. So we can see here now in the final screenshot, I, I was able to access the bucket, pull back the files, and see, you know, the, pull back that ASCII art whale. So, so I. You know, I just I wanted to kind of highlight the basics of how this works inside the AWS environment, um, as there's a lot of components or things to step through here. But um, when you start chaining all this knowledge together, it can be really impactful. All right, so common privs vectors. So people often ask, like, what's the biggest ways that if you get like a limited user in AWS, how are you really going to get to admin? And yeah, I saw that fancy graph that you just showed me, and you walked me through the one scenario. But in, at an aggregate, what are like the kind of guiding rules to getting PrivS working in cloud? And, and basically, I, I like to boil it back to these two things, right? If you can get permissions to you know, the IAM equivalent in the cloud provider or in the account, or if you can manipulate resources uh, that have higher privileges than you currently have, I mean, you're going to be on a, a path potentially to priv asking in the environment. So I'll walk you through that. Like obviously if we get access to like an identity and that identity has permissions to create more access keys or modify user per, users profiles or things like that, that's you know just kind of like standard admin activity. You'll you potentially can priv ask just by picking a, another user that has higher privileges than you and updating their settings. You know, an another way would be to muck with the policies that are attached to an identity, right? Like a lot of times, you'll have multiple versions of the same policy, and the policy when in an old version will be very insecure. And then the security team will come around and say, like, "Hey, you guys got to fix that." They'll issue a new version that's much more um, hardened. But then if they don't lock down who can roll back to the previous versions of the policies, that could be another privess. Um, Path. So any type of policy permission modifications, that's another privest path. And, and that includes you know, the ability to kind of um, you know, update anything associated with like assume role policies or those trust policies attached to the resources too, right? But you know, typically like when you do a social engineering engagement, you know, you sometimes you get lucky, you land on an admin's box, but a lot of times you're, you're gonna land on an engineer's box. And, an engineer, a lot of times, isn't going to have IAM permissions, right? This stuff is res restricted for kind of like those admins. So that's, that's really where r the past role permission becomes critical, as well as the focusing on manipulating resources, right? Like if you are an engineer on a team, and then you're building an application, and you have access to AWS, you probably have the ability to do some type of cr resource creation or resource modification inside the AWS environment. So the question there is, can you modify something that has greater privileges than yourself? And, and basically, the three boiled down ways to do this is, can you create a new resource like we just saw? Can I create a new EC2 and attach a higher level of privilege to it? Can I affect an input 
like sometimes people have build processes and they just store the source code for their inputs in like S3. Can I just go modify that? And next time there's a build, I'll be upstream and, and that will execute with higher permissions than I have. Or can I get into something that's currently processing the resources and modify that? Um, yeah, so th that's kind of on that side. And, and just to kind of call out some examples here, like let's say they have Lambda scripts, which are really common, right? If you can update the Lambda script and the role associated with the Lambda script is higher privs than the user is, that's a priv s path right there. Same with EC2 and SSM. A lot of EC2 instances, a lot of organizations use SSM to manage them. If you can just start an SSM session up inside of an EC2 instances that has a role that's higher privs than yourself, that's a priv s path. And then, you know, just kind of going through a bunch of the AWS services, looking for anything that has a higher level role attached to it than yourself. So really, you know, um, that, that's kind of the breakdown there, in my opinion, of the kind of easy button ways to privess when you get a limited user inside an AWS environment. Okay. So um, let's just say you're like, hey, this talk was really cool. I want to do more of this at my house, but I didn't understand, you know, 1% of what Bryce said. So there's a bunch of great resources here to help you get started. Um, so namely, Cloud Goat, I Am Vulnerable, Sad Cloud, AWS Goat. These are great resources. So you can, uh, these are open source projects, um, and you can go and, you know, create an AWS account. If you want to just start out, I, I recommend like the I Am Vulnerable. Um, that's going to help you, and then like a basically zero cost way, create a free account, deploy a bunch of misconfigured I Am settings, and be able to identify them with tools. Um, Cloud Goat, Sad Cloud, and AWS Goat are awesome as well, um, but some of those can create resources that are going to charge you a little bit of money. So, and you definitely don't want to do this in like a production account. These are all going to create misconfigurations that are exploitable. Um, and then there's lots of like, if you just Google for walkthroughs, there's lots of walkthroughs for these four. Um, so you can, you know, even if you can kind of follow along. And then if you're looking more on like the blue team defense perspective, there's a lot of tools that are going to help you visualize it. I mean, the ones that I recommend are, are kind of, I mean, Cloud Scout is the combination of AWS PX and Storm Spotter. So I think that's a, that's a good place to start or start with one of those three tools. And then I, I really like road tools. Um, but it's a little less user-friendly, I'd say. And there's a number of other ones that are out there. Um, this isn't a comprehensive list. I'm sure you can find more. Okay. Um, you know, at stage two, uh, we built our own tool. So hats off to Paul for this, which helps like automate a lot of this process that's backed by a GraphDB database. Mostly because AWS PX doesn't support all the services that we run into for clients. Um, and also because we wanted something that was um, a little more refined. So, um, but so you know, I've seen another a couple other organizations build their own tools. So that's kind of like the evolution is start with the open source stuff, figure out where the gaps are, and then kind of build additional tooling on top of it. Okay, cool. Um, okay, I'm not gonna. I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, the first part, but uh, you know, I, I, I do want to be conscious of the time, um, so I won't, I won't go too much into it. But um, talking for a minute about Azure AD, which is kind of like the authentication SSO solution for Azure. Uh, shout outs to Anthony, he made a bunch of these slides. Uh, you know, Azure AD, it's really trying to be that unified identity platform for Microsoft, right? So whether you have like O365 or you have an Azure account using the resource manager, your typical like ISAS, um, like uh, VM deployments, um, they're going to use this Azure AD for authentication. And Azure, Azure Active Directory and Active Directory are to totally two different things, right? So Active Directory is usually like on-prem servers that are you use to manage permissions of laptops throughout your enterprise. Azure Active Directory is more like, a, like an OAuth of service almost, right? It's um, you know, going to be API driven. Um, so here's the portal you go to to kind of manage, manage your Azure AD infrastructure. 
There's a lot of different Python modules that you can use to manage your Azure AD infrastructure out there. I've listed some of them here if you're interested. And um, they're fairly easy to use, right? You can just import the modules and then start using them to connect to Azure AD and use the various services. I'll just, you know, we need to go over all this, right? Um, if you're interested in this stuff, I'll post the slides up to my Twitter um, after the talk later today. So, Okay, but under the hood, there's these different APIs, which are going to allow you to interact with Azure AD. So um, you're going to have the, like, the Microsoft GRASS APIs. You're going to have the Azure AD APIs. You're going to have these Exchange Provisioning Service APIs. And um, you know, you're going to be able to stand up your standard tools for doing app testing, like Burp and Proxy, those connection requests through it. And you know, on a general level, you'll log into the management portal. That will call APIs. And then those APIs will call even more internal APIs, and those will take some action in your account on your behalf. Um, so you know, if you just kind of start analyzing this enough, you can figure out, oh, I don't actually need to go through those, um, um, you know, those Azure portal APIs. I can go directly to the internal graph APIs and start making queries there. And the, the tool road tools, um, uh, Dijerk, or um, sorry if I butchered that name, uh, he, you know, he gave a great talk about this, how you can kind of bypass those APIs and go directly to the internal ones. And Road Tools leverages a lot of that technology to collect a lot of data um, deep inside your Azure AD infrastructure. Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk for a minute about the Azure AD join stuff, and then um, and then I'll move on to that kind of end of the talk. So, so the um, what is Azure AD? So you know, we, we've had all these endpoints that are inside like a traditional office setting, and they're joined to Active Directory, right? Well, with the advent of Windows 10 and one of the newer versions and Windows 11, um, you can actually set up your endpoints now to authenticate directly to Azure AD uh, via, via these APIs. Um, so you don't need to have on-prem or in the cloud Azure Active, Active Directory services, right? So um, you know, you can go inside. Uh, there's a good blog post that will walk you through this at the bottom of the slide. You can say join to Azure AD. And um, there's steps here are kind of listed out in the slide. Uh, I'm not going to get into a ton. But uh, basically what's going to happen is when you log into your laptop, it's going to authenticate you using a user that's in Azure Active Directory. That's going to give the endpoint a token. And then, you know, potentially if that laptop gets compromised, the token can be pulled out of the endpoint and could be reused by the attacker to authenticate with whatever permissions that endpoint had to Azure. So there's a bunch of tools out there that'll let you do that. Um, Tiffkin wrote this one, and it's pretty reliable. Uh, it'll basically go through and pull the um, token out of memory, the JWT, and you'll be able to reuse that JWT to re-authenticate to Azure Active Directory. Shouts out to Logan. He made like a cool video on how to do this, um, which I'll kind of just walk through briefly, but uh, and then I'll move on uh, with the last portion of the talk. Okay, so okay, so we we got interactive. We have our own internal toolkit called Voodoo. It's kind of like our you know. Um, Cobalt Strike equivalent, but it works on Windows, Linux, Mac, and uh, and uh, yeah. So we kind of have our Voodoo server sitting here, so we can run commands on our target. We've compromised an endpoint, and that endpoint is using Azure. Um, it's Azure AD joined, right? So um, you know, here on the endpoint, we're going to show on the attacker side that we're not we're not logged into. Uh, I apologize. We're not logged into. Uh, Azure at all at this point. Uh, when we flip over, you can see like not logged in, right? Okay, so then using Voodoo, uh, we can see we've got access to a remote target. Uh, that's named Jason Bourne, and that might be a little hard to read. Uh, we load up .NET into memory only on the target. And then we use the tool that Tifkin wrote to extract that JWT from memory. 
because the user's already logged in their laptop and authenticated to Azure Active Directory. Once we grab that JWT, we just insert it in our browser as a cookie. That's what's going on here. And now we're authenticated as the user. Um, so, you know, we can kind of see this future of everything being joined by SSO to one central authentication uh, system is great because it's going to be more user intuitive for endpoint users. But um, if the endpoint gets compromised, you know, it's also going to enable the attackers to pick up those same credentials and potentially reuse them. So, and obviously, like Azure has a lot of like conditional access control. So that could be implemented to prevent these type of attacks, but um, that's kind of the default state as of today. All right, cool. Okay, so um, there's some other content, but I, I don't want to like belabor it. Um, all right, because I want to get to the, towards the end, and I want to make sure I'm conscious on time. So, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, come talk afterwards. I'm happy to go over those slides. Okay, so um, the, the one thing that I just wanted to talk about was something cool that the team came up with. Um, so the idea came from Scott Piper. I don't know if he's here, but um, thanks, Scott. Um, so basically, let's say you have an admin of an AWS environment, and you know, they're doing admining things, like they're spinning up instances, they're deploying CloudFormation templates, they're you know, modifying permissions, they're creating Lambdas, they're doing all the greatness, right? And you're an attacker, and you're just sitting over here with your AWS account, and you're like feeling lonely. You're like, I need, I need some of that admin, admin access, right? So, um, so we came up with this technique. Well, Scott came up with it. He wrote it up in the blog, but there's really no implementation that I knew about. So, so we built an implementation for it. So, basically, uh, you know, we built a social engineering email that had a big button that said "Launch Stack," right? Like basically, there's an update to this service that you're using in AWS, or this third-party service that you're leveraging. Like, you know, imagine there's a lot of services that require you to deploy a stack in CloudFormation and um, to get onboarded. So we send an email in, and we convince the user to click on the launch stack link. And this is a user that we think already has admin access to AWS. And then AWS has like kind of like this quick stack deployment um, URL. So we can actually build a CloudFormation template, basically like a malicious CloudFormation template, and link to that template, uh, which this uh, link will link out to. So basically, it's going to take the user, right, and we'll need to store that uh, template in an S3 bucket. So here on the attacker side, we're going to create an, an S3 bucket. We're going to put the malicious CloudFormation template in that S3 bucket. And then we're going to send an email to the user. And if the user clicks that launch stack button, they're going to get presented with this uh, screen. So basically, all they need to do at this point is click the I acknowledge and then the create stack button. And then you know we'll have full access to the target's AWS account. And, and I'll kind of I'll walk you through a little bit more about how that happens. So, so we send the email in on the left over here. That's going to reference the malicious cloud, uh, cloud formation template in our bucket. That's going to bring them to that quick deployment screen. If they actually click the Create Stack button, that's going to create the stack in their AWS account. Now, there's a lot of different paths you can take from here once you get that to occur, but you can actually, here's one scenario, right? We could have that stack, if the user has rights, create a role. We could have them attach a policy to that role that gives our attacker's AWS account access to the target's account. So basically, we can ride through roles to kind of get into the target account there. The one thing that you kind of hook up, you get hooked up on this, this attack scenario is that um, the target's account if they create the stack, will be linked to the attacker's account. But the attacker doesn't necessarily know the, the target's AWS account ID number in this attack scenario, right? So the attacker needs a way to kind of communicate that information back to them. So, um, so we, as an attacker, we can use the AWS SAM framework uh, 
uh, which leverages CloudFormation or the hood, to build some resources. And so the resources that I built in the SAM template is a, a role with a policy, an API gateway to collect the, the target account's number, a Lambda function that will take that number and store it in an S3 bucket, um, so then we can review those results later and kind of assume into the target's account. Right, so, and I know I'm going to get a lot of slack for this slide because it's just arrows everywhere, but, <laughs> but basically, <laughs> When you put it all together, you send the phishing email in, they cl click create the stack, right? If they click create the stack, then it's gonna load the template from our attacker's bucket, it's gonna launch the stack, the stack's gonna create a role, that role is gonna trust another role that's in the attacker's account, and then we'll need to know the a target's account number. So it's gonna create a Lambda function, take that Lambda, use the Lambda function to communicate back the account number to the attacker's API gateway, which is then gonna use another Lambda function to store it in S3 bucket, so the attacker can move backwards into the target's account with admin access. So, so it's a little bit of madness. So you might be asking yourself, why do this? And also, like, I could do it better. And I totally agree with that you could do it better. There's ways to make this better, right? But why do this, right? Well, if you get into an environment and they have FIDO2 plus WebAuthN, your adversary in the middle attacks are gonna fail. Right? But look at this scenario, right? The URL that the user clicked on isn't hosted by the attacker. Nothing's hosted by the attacker. It's all hosted by AWS. 100% reputable domains. 100%, um, you know, FIDO2, they're gonna authenticate fine, right? They're gonna authenticate to AWS. So, um, you know, this is a potential attack vector where all known security controls, you're just basically targeting the human. They have to know hey, something seems sus, I shouldn't be deploying this CloudFormation template, let's, let's back up, right? And you know, obviously, I'm not recommending everybody do this uh, from a red teaming or pen testing standpoint. I get it's complex and you know, probably not needed in most scenarios, but it is a demonstration of an attack that would bypass you know, the FIDO2 protections. So, so um, I pushed some sample code up here. Um, you'll need to go through it and like, make some modifications. But uh, um, you know, if you're looking to recreate it in your pen test, that might be helpful. So, all right. And you know, with that being said, I'm going to wrap up. So, thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. If you have any more questions, I'll be hanging out. So, um, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming out. <laughs>